<clears throat> well, I, uh, I, I, I had asked Brantley this question before I walked up here, and we were, he's like, well, Alf, Elf, and I was like, well, yeah, for sure, you know, and we were going through our list, and then I said, well, well a Christmas story, and he, he just looked at me blankly, <laughs> and I said, you know, Ralphie, and you shoot your eye out, and he's like, you're old. I have no idea what that is. 1983, Brantley. Us cool people were around at that time. <clears throat> That's right. <laughs> we got a brother back there. Well, one of the movies that's on my list, and I don't know, it doesn't make a lot of people's lists, uh, I don't think, but is The Santa Claus, The Santa Claus, with uh, Tim Allen. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it, and there's, there's only probably maybe a few of you that haven't seen it, it's about a man named Scott Calvin who accidentally causes old St. Nick to fall off of the roof, and he goes around to just kind of like investigate what the loud noise was, and he finds an empty Santa suit there with a small business card, and he reads the business card, and the business card basically says, put on the suit and the reindeer will know what to do. So he puts on the suit, and then pretty soon he and his son are whisked away by the reindeer as he has to complete Santa's delivery on that particular night. Now, the next day, Christmas morning, he wakes up, and he's convinced that it was all just an elaborate dream. But his son seems to think, no, no, it was real. His son can recall all the same things that he could recall. And so as the movie goes on, the son is trying to convince his dad, no, dad, you actually are the Santa Claus. And then he's also trying to convince... Uh, his mom, who's been remarried to a man named Neil, one of the greatest characters in all Christmas movies. <laughs> Neil is so genius. Oh, man, I love Neil. Anyway, uh, but, but the movie centers around this Christmas theme, and the theme is in lots and lots of these movies, which is, will you believe or not? Will you believe that this person, this very special being, this one about whom you've dreamt and you've thought and all this, will you believe that they are actually in your midst or will you miss him? And that's really our question for today. Not, not about Santa Claus, but will we, miss, will we miss the very, very, very important special one who is in our midst? Because December is crazy. December is crazy. I was talking to my uh, uh, son just yesterday and he said, Dad, it feels like December is flying by. And he's right, because in December, there's tons of work to do. And there's a lot of studying to do. Some of y'all are like staring down the barrel of the finals gun right now. And then, then there's a lot of cleaning to do. And then there's a lot of shopping to do. And then there's planning to do. And then there's more cleaning to do. And then there's uh, cooking to do. And then there's traveling to do. And then there's some church services that you might go to. Thanks for being here today and battling the absolute mud pit that we call our parking lot. Thank you for that. There's a lot to do. And it is easy to miss the very important one who is right in our midst. Dad, pun alert, it's easy for Christmas to become Christmas. Huh? Huh? Yeah, that's bad. That's really... Feel free to use that with your friends if you want them to leave you, I guess. But in order to make sure that we do not waste this incredible time of year and blow our opportunity to encounter the real Jesus... We have been looking at the names and the titles of Jesus in the, in the birth narratives right at the very beginning. And today we're going to be in Matthew 1, as Adam mentioned. That is page 807, if you grab the Bible in front of you. We're going to be in Matthew 1. We're going to kind of continue on with some of the verses we looked at last week. Next week, Pastor Pat is going to be here, Lord willing, and he's going to carry us forward in our sermon series. As many of you know and been praying, he has been going through uh, or he went through a treatment that seems to be doing really well, which is awesome. And I know that we're excited to see him and have him back and all of that. Uh, just FYI, uh, in order for him to kind of protect his immune system as he's still recovering, you will see him here, and then like a superhero, he'll disappear in between the services. So you may not get to actually, please don't go hug him uh, or anything like that, uh, just for, for his sake with the germs. But we are excited that he is going to be back. But last week we began at the beginning beginning of Christmas with the beauty and the brilliance of God's creation and how God promised even in the garden that someday I'm going to send a snake crusher, one who will save you. And we discovered what his name was, which is Jesus 
or Yesu in Greek, or does anybody remember the Hebrew from last week? It was a long time ago. Anyone? Yeshua. Yeshua. Oh, that's good. You guys are good, which means, of course, that Yahweh saves. And so that's who Jesus is. He is the embodiment of Yahweh, the Savior of the world. Well, let's continue reading and see what other titles or names that he's given. So this is Matthew 18, or Matthew 1, starting in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Emmanuel, today we are going to look at the name Emmanuel and break it into its three parts. But first, Matthew tells us right away that this name of Jesus was actually given. This nickname, this name was given to Jesus years and years and years and years and years before this account was written. Now, that is not the way that we do nicknames, right? Like nicknames, generally speaking, are earned. I mean, think about the, think about the, sport, the famous sports nicknames that, that are out there. So you have uh, Prime Time or Neon Dion, right, for, for Dion Sanders, Michael, Air, Jordan, Pistol, Pete, Maravich, Tiger Woods, The Fridge, Perry. So those, again, us 80s children, we remember the refrigerator. And of course, maybe the greatest nickname of all sports nicknames, Babe Ruth, who was named George Herman Ruth by his parents. But he became known by a bunch of nicknames like Babe and also the Sultan of Swat, the King of Crash, the Colossus of Clout, the Colossus of Clout, Babe Ruth, and the Great Bambino. And in the words of one author, George's nicknames multiplied due to his personal history and his signature talent on the baseball field. Uh, in other words, as he did heroic things, he was given nicknames. Right? As his career went along, people got to know who this was. He got nicknames associated with his acts of heroism on a ball field. In the case of Jesus, Matthew says this nickname came hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before the story I'm telling you right now. It's kind of weird, right? Unless, unless the story he's telling is about somebody more important than a sports hero or a king, or something like that, unless this person was actually around in some way for hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of years beforehand, then it could make sense, and in Jesus' case, it does. So we're going to look at this name, Emmanuel, this nickname given before any of the rest of the story of Jesus preaching sermons and healing sickness and even dying, before those stories, we're going to look at the first story where this name Emmanuel comes from. To understand Emmanuel, you actually have to go back several hundred years to Isaiah chapter 7. You can flip to Isaiah 7 if you're so inclined. We're going to kind of be there. You can kind of follow the story to the best of your ability. Now, if you just read Isaiah 7 and you don't look at the Kings, Chronicles, whatever, to try to understand the historical context, it's a little bit tough to tell what's going on in Isaiah chapter 7. So I'll give you my very best short version of what's happening in Isaiah chapter 7. Once upon a time, there was this king named King Ahaz, and he was the king of God's people, but he was staring down two enemies who were basically at his gates, and he was terrified that they might come in and take over Jerusalem, kill him, capture God's people, all of those kinds of things. And so he was very afraid of these two enemies that were right there, and he started to think, like, how can I get out of this? So he looked around, and he saw the big, bad Assyrian empire, and he thought, if I can make an alliance with that empire, it's like making a deal with the devil, right? If I can make an alliance with that empire, then maybe it will get this threat of these two out of here. But Isaiah came, and Isaiah was a prophet, and he's like, hey, hey, don't do that. Like, if you align yourself with the big bad wolf on the block, bad things are going to happen to you eventually. Like, you invite the wolf into the sheep's pen, that's not a good plan. And he said, tell you what, 
God will rescue you. And Ahaz was like, yeah, but the threat's here. And he's like, no, no, God's going to rescue you. In fact, God wants you to be so confident that he's going to rescue you that ask him for a sign and he'll give it to you. And then you can know just how confident you can be in God. Now, oftentimes in the Bible when we see like somebody asking God for a sign, it's like, whoa, 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 don't put God to the test, right? Like that seems wrong. Like some of us have tried it. Which college should I go to, God? Uh, this one or that one? And we open our eyes and we like look for some, like that's foolishness, all right? But in this case, the prophet actually said, no, no, God wants you to be confident, so ask for a sign. Well, Ahaz was like, I... If I ask for a sign and God gives it to me, then I'll have to obey him. <laughs> I, uh, I got an idea. I, I, wanna, I want my cake and I want to eat it too. No, no, Isaiah. I'm not going to ask for a sign because I don't want to test God. You know? I don't want to test him. Uh, so whatever with the sign thing, I'm just going to go ahead and make this, uh, uh, this alliance because I'm such a spiritual person. Have you ever heard anybody, like, spiritualize their disobedience before? Have you ever spiritualized your disobedience before? That's, that's what he does. He says, no, no, I, I don't want to sign. I'm just going to make this other alliance. Well, when he does that, Isaiah says, oh, you, you, you fool. You, you, were, you were more convinced of the threat than you were of the promise. Like the danger before you was so great to you that you didn't trust God. So he said, you know what? God is going to give you a sign. And this is what you see in 7 verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. There's our, there's our Matthew verse. Isaiah said there would be a special child named Emmanuel, whose life would guarantee rescue and salvation. Now, we're not sure how Ahaz got that sign. Isaiah doesn't tell us. And so for years, scholars have argued, like, was there, like, some young woman, a virgin, whatever, who had a baby at that time? Is, is this related to Hezekiah? Like, there's a whole bunch of scholars that are. We don't know. That. Here's what we know. What we know for sure is that in his moment of incredible anxiety and fear, Ahaz refused to trust God to save him, and he looked to other people to try to rescue him. In his mind, the enemy's threat was greater than God's presence. That's the background of this name, Emmanuel. The name is a sign, a promise that God will be there for his people in their most difficult moments, and he will rescue. But what does the name mean? Well, Matthew tells us, and these three things are going to be our kind of three parts of this sermon. He tells us it means God with us. So what does Emmanuel mean? Well, first, it means God. God. We mentioned this last week, but if you're wondering who Jesus is, he is God with us. Jesus is God. You can find people, including some who are considered to be scholars, who will argue that Jesus is not God and that Jesus never even claimed to be God. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, there's a historian, scholar guy who, who walked away from kind of Christian faith years ago. His name's Bart Ehrman. You may have seen his books or whatever. So I was like, oh, wow, Bart Ehrman book. It's a bestseller. He's got this brand new finding. It's like, oh, it's really cool. It's just old heresy, like repackaged. And... Um, and one of the things he says in that interview, essentially, is that, you know, Jesus didn't claim to be God. He, this, is, this is his actual quote. He said, I think it's completely implausible that Matthew, Mark, and Luke would not mention that Jesus called himself God if that's what he was declaring about himself. That would be a rather important point to make. Well, la -di da More recently, you can find a Muslim apologist on TikTok. There's a bunch of them. And there's one that said, it said this, his name is Zakir Naik, and I don't know exactly what his credentials are, but he seems smart. He said, if anyone can show me unequivocally in the Bible where Jesus says, I'm God, worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. And their argument is that Jesus never even claimed to be God, and that's just an invention of Christians later. Now, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but 
When Bart Ehrman mentioned that, he said Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He kind of left out one of the four <laughs> eyewitnesses. His math's not great. It's a C, 75%. I mean, that's good. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, this uh, Muslim scholar as well, he, he doesn't mention that. Because if you look at John, it very clearly Jesus says, I am which is like the name of God. In fact, it was so unequivocal and so clear and so unambiguous that those that heard it were like, we have to kill this guy for blasphemy. So they were not confused by what Jesus was saying. And you're saying, yeah, but that was just John. And I think I heard somebody say John was written late and that's scary. Okay, well, there's tons and tons and tons of other evidence throughout the Gospels of Jesus being God. So here is a little bit of the evidence, and this is a little apologetic, and Dave B. can do a way better job of this, and you should go to his class when we have more space, because it's already full. But th this is just some of the evidence you can find. So Jesus has the attributes of God. I'm going to fly through some of this stuff. So if you're like, I want to write it all down, good luck. Uh, just take a picture. Eternal, um, omnipresent, omniscient, immutable, omnipotent, and you can see a bunch of scripture references. He accepts worship as God. So we have some scripture references there. He's called creator. He forgives sins. He resurrects and he judges. He claims that he and the Father are one. He has titles like the names ascribed to him today, God with us. And here's another one. I didn't write this one down, but this, is, this might be my favorite of all the claims of Jesus to be God. Jesus was born into a very devout Jewish family. Do you know what the core of the Jewish faith is? It's the statement. It's called the Shema. And to say it, you have to kind of spit on each other. Shema Israel, Adonai, Adonai Eloheinu, Echad, Adonai, something like that, right? <laughs> now, what is that phrase saying? Listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. One God. Now, if you were raised in a, in a Greek-Roman home that worshipped a pantheon of gods, that family, if you're like, I'm a god, they might be like, that's possible. <laughs> if you're raised in a Jewish home where the fundamental core of their faith is the oneness of God, and then you start acting like God, do you think a devout Jewish family is going to embrace that sort of behavior? See, see, this is what's crazy, that Jesus' family members come to worship him. I heard Tim Keller say once, if I was going to try to convince anyone in the world that I'm God, I would not start with my family. <laughs> <laughs> because they know too much. Jesus' mother worshipped him. His brother, his name's James, called James the Just by some, was such a devout Old Testament Jewish follower, and yet he came to call himself a slave of Jesus, and tradition holds that he was stoned to death because he believed his own brother was the Messiah, the Son of God, God in the flesh. Since the very beginning, Christians who have read the Bible closely have seen that Jesus is fully divine, a member of the Holy Trinity, God in the flesh. The foolish claims of men like Airman and Nail are hardly new, which brings us to our church history nerd moment of the day. Now, I know how much you love church history because I just saw you all perk up, but <laughs> once upon a time in the 300s AD, there was a man named Arius, and Arius was teaching what became known as Arianism later. Uh, but, but, but essentially what he was saying was that Jesus is this special important guy, but he's not divine. He's not fully divine like God is fully divine. And so there was this council of like bishops, like important pastors, if you will. And there's like 300 of them. And they all gathered together and like, we want to hear what this Arius has to say. And Arius was like, all right, here's, here's, my best, uh, here's my best teaching. And so he just passionately was describing why Jesus is not divine. Well, it made one of the bishops so upset who was there that he couldn't listen to this heresy anymore that he got up and he walked over and he slapped Arius across the face. So you're like, oh man, church meetings are so bad today. Listen, listen, <laughs> we're doing all right. Well, all the bishops were sort of alarmed by this outburst, and so they, they threw this bishop 
who had slapped the slapping bishop, we'll call him. They threw the slapping bishop into jail, and they took away his little priestly vestment thing and whatever. Well, the next morning, according to legend, miraculously he had like a new priestly vestment. He had the word of God before him, and all of his chains were laying on the ground as he just was sitting there docilely reading the scriptures. Well, they, they freed him, and, and they later agreed with him, not that you should go slapping everybody, but, but that Arius was in fact a heretic and that Jesus is clearly divine. And they wrote this beautiful creed that we call the Nicene Creed. And there's a line in it that says, or a couple lines, it says, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. They wanted to make it as clear as possible that all followers of Christ would know Jesus is truly divine. Now, you may not know much about church history, but you do, in fact, know the name of the slapping bishop. You know his name because he became famous at at some point. In fact, the thing that everybody was like, oh, yeah, he's really famous for, was not so much the slapping It was for gift-giving. The slapping bishop's name was St. Nicholas. St. Nick. So, true story. At your next holiday gathering, when they're like, how are we celebrating? (laughs) You can do Secret Santa or slap a heretic. Either one (laughs) would be in honor of St. Nick. Jolly old St. Nick. Merry Christmas, everyone. (laughs) Anyway, okay. All right, that was just a little bit of an aside. Back to Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is God. Now, if Jesus is God, this causes tremendous conflict for us, doesn't it? If he's not just a special baby, then we are confronted with the fact that you cannot ignore this Jesus. You cannot just sort of like him, think he's cute, You can't just sort of listen to some things and not others. If he's God, you must take him seriously. So seriously that when he says something, you have to do it. If you don't do it, you are his enemy. Now you're like, whoa, that's a little like, Because I I don't want to do whatever Jesus says, but I also don't feel like his enemy. Okay, so imagine you walked into an ancient king's courts. And he said, all who enter must bow their knee to me and swear their loyalty to me. And you say, well, I'm not really into the bowing thing, king. Don't tread on me. I don't really do that. I mean, I'm not mad at you, king, but I'm just going to stand. In your heart, you might not feel like the king's enemy, but your head is about to be removed from your body. Because, well, he's the king. You must bend your knee. This baby that's born is not just a king. He's a king. He's not just a king. He is God in the flesh. So don't miss this. If you feel conflicted about who Jesus is, good. You should. If there are things that he says that are hard to do, and you're like, I'm not sure I want to do this, but I should probably do it, then you're getting closer to the truth of who Jesus is. He's God with us. God with us. He's able. He's Emmanuel. He saves. He can do all of this, but he's also making a demand of who we are. This Christmas, let's not forget that Jesus is God. Part two. He is God. That's conflict, but he's God with. He's got, there's a withness about who Jesus is. That the God and the creator of the universe would come and be with us. Now, it is possible to be near somebody without really being with somebody, right? Like you might be near a bunch of people right now and you're not really like with them, with them. You're just sort of near them. My my wife and I uh, were invited to go to this fundraiser at Chrysler. It was a Chad Tough thing. It was awesome from some of GBC's finest. Thanks, guys. It was really fun. And it was great. And we walked around Chrysler, and it was all fancy, and we dressed up and all the stuff. And we were near a bunch of really, like, important sportsy people and other people around the university. And I'm like, oh, that's a famous person. That's a famous person. You know, all this stuff. 
and it, it was cool. And we, we had great, you know, great food, great conversation. I got to sit next to a couple of the football players. They were super good dudes and all of that. And it was neat to be near them, but I wasn't really with them. What I mean is that 99% of the people in that building had zero clue who I am. They didn't care. They didn't go home and tell their kids, I got to sit and talk to the Tyson and Charity Lemke. <laughs> Did you get a picture, Mom? No, they, they didn't know. They had no idea who I was. Had I been there or not been there, it, it would have made no difference to most of the people. Now, the people that I was there with, awesome people, glad to be there, so thankful for it. But I was near people. I wasn't actually with people. We find out that God is with us. He's near, yes, but more than just near. He's aware. He speaks. He cares. He walks. He's able. Now, when you look at God's presence in the Old Testament, it can be a little bit terrifying at times. Like you work through some of those different moments in the Old Testament, and there's like a burning bush, and the ground is even holy so that Moses can't really approach it. He's got to take his sandals off. And there's another time where, where there's like a pillar of cloud and, and fire, or where fire descends on the top of Mount Sinai, and it like burns up, or where Moses can't even see the face of God. He sees like kind of his back or his shoulder or something, and his face glow. Like it looks kind of terrifying, the presence of God in the Old Testament. And yet what we know is that all through the Old Testament, starting in the garden, God wants to be with his people. God keeps moving toward his people. They're the ones who run away. He moves toward them. He wants to help. And, and no place is this more obvious than with Jesus. That Jesus comes to be with us. Yes, there's conflict in standing before God, but there's also this empowering, this encouragement of knowing that the God of the universe wants to be near us and beyond near us wants to be with us and to help us. One of the Olympic moments um, that, that is probably one of the most famous Olympic moments, it happened in 1992 in Barcelona. A sprinter named Derek Redmond had battled numerous injuries throughout his career. But when he went into the 400-meter race, he was one of the favorites. But at about 200 meters, he pulled up with a ham, hamstring pull. I don't know if you guys remember this or not. You should look it up later. It's really powerful. And he kind of falls to the ground. He's kind of limping, and he tries to get up. And then all of a sudden, just this guy in full-on dad mode. I mean, he looks so dad-like, doesn't he? Like the hat and all the whole thing. Just comes like sprinting down, and all the attendants are like, No, no, like spectators don't get to sprint onto the racetrack during the Olympics. But it was his dad. And so his dad runs over and puts his arm around, he holds him for a second, and, and, and Derek starts weeping on his shoulder. It's, I mean, it is powerful. And he's covering his eyes, he's holding like this against his dad, and his dad is just walking him towards the finish line, trying to make sure to stay within the lines. And he's going to get us. And two or three times, people come over and the dad's just like, get out of here. This is my son. And he, and he sees the race through with him. And when they cross the line, 65,000 people, they rise and they cheer. And we see it and there's something so moving. It, like, it, I, I can watch it now. I've seen it a hundred times. It makes me want to cry. Why? Because it's a picture of the God of the universe going, come on, Ty. I've seen you try. I've seen you fail. You said you had a few successes, and then you wiped out real bad. I've seen your grief. I'm going to see you through. I'm with you. I'm helping you. I'm empowering you. I'm encouraging. I am here. I am God with you. This should give us such tremendous courage. To know that God is in our corner should help us face anything, that he has our back. That when we wipe out, he's like, firing out of the stands to come to our side. I remember a friend in high school telling me how he had almost gotten in a fight on the weekend. I was like, dude, how? He's like, so I went to this like sliding hill thing and I was tubing. As I went down the hill, I accidentally bumped into another tube, but everybody was fine, so I didn't think anything of it. And I walked away with my tube to go back to the top of the hill. And next thing I know, I'm getting tapped on the shoulder and I turn around, there's these two angry looking punks and... He said it was clear they were spoiling for a fight. And they were both like, ugh. And he's like, and I probably wasn't going to win. Um, and I was looking at them like, uh. He said, so I began to look around for like an escape route. 
And he said, when I turned like this, there were two massive guys behind me. I had no idea who they were, but I tapped them on the shoulder, and I said, these guys want to fight us. <laughs> I was like, dude, that was quick. He's like, my life was on the line. You better believe that was quick. And they saw the two giants' confused looks, and they mistook it for anger or something, and, and the two punks were like, and we'll see you later, and they just left. Now, I love the idea. I love the idea that when something horrible happens to me, it's a terrible medical diagnosis. It's debt. It's a brutal relational thing. That I can genuinely say, Jesus, cancer wants to fight us. Divorce wants to fight us. Debt wants to fight us. This thing wants to fight us, but I know, I know that you're here. Because it's, even, it's built into your name that God is with us. That he's with us. Whatever the problem is that you are facing right now, is it so big that the presence of God can't solve it? Is it? Because he's here. So whatever our problem is, it's trying to fight you and Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's fighting you both. Now, when the mother of John and Charles Wesley, her name is Susanna Wesley, in some ways she's called the mother of uh, uh, the Methodist church. But on her deathbed, it was so telling to her children. And she's nearing the very end. She's about to be called home to glory. And she tells them, don't weep, but rather sing a hymn of praise. And with her very final breath, she said, God is with us. So he's God. That's a tremendous amount of conflict that that brings. And, but he's also with, and there's a tremendous amount of courage that ought to come into our lives with that. But he's also God with, third part, part three, us. He's with us. Did you notice what Matthew said? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, both he and Isaiah, they did not say he'll be called Emmanuel, which means God with everybody. God with all, God with them. Now, both texts say that God is with us. And what, he's, what they're saying is that the God of the universe is with us, his people, those who have come to recognize who Jesus is. Those who have bent their knee in repentance to King Jesus, who have seen his work on the cross and know that the tomb is empty and have come to trust him to save rather than our own manipulations and our own like earthly saviors that we can see out there. No, no. For those who have come to recognize who Jesus truly is and have placed their faith in him, that he is with them in a unique kind of way. In a powerful way, that he has, be, he has actually even become one of us. He's become one of us. So that we always know that he's, yeah, he's able, he's with, he's the big guy. But he's actually like with us. So I don't know if you've had this uh, moment before where you've gone through some kind of terrible season of suffering. And um, may, maybe it was uh, one of the ones I just mentioned. It was a, like a a disease or a divorce or, or it's grief or something like that. And you've gone through that season and you've thought, I feel so alone. No, nobody knows what this feels like. So I, this has it's been an interesting thing for me, that if I find somebody who lost their dad in the last couple of years, because I did, I feel like this weird like comfort and connection to them, because I'm like, oh, you get it. Like, you've... you've You've done. If I meet another pastor, I love being a pastor, but there's like just something about the fact that you've actually walked in the same life I have and have lived with this brilliant and wonderful responsibility that feels heavy on occasion that like you, oh, oh yeah, we're like, it's like we, right? There's only one God who can say to you, I get it. I'm, I'm one of you. Oh, I, I was tempted too. I, I got hungry. I was tired. I wept. I, I, I experienced all kinds of things that you've experienced. 
I even walked through death. So if you're facing death itself and you're terrified, I get it. I, I, I sweat blood. It was so intense before I was crucified. I find, I find this really fascinating. There's this psalm. This is long before we know about Jesus' death and resurrection. There's a psalm, maybe the most famous of all the psalms, Psalm 23. And I just want you to, I want you to catch the language of this just, just, just for a moment. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Now, if you didn't catch what I'm about to point out to you, that's okay. I didn't catch it the first thousand times I read this either. But I was listening to a pastor, and he said, I want you to think about a mother whose son serves in the military, and she doesn't know when he'll be home. And so when she talks about John, she says, well, when John gets home, he will help me in the garden. And when John gets home, he will help me with the, with the shutter thing that I'm struggling. And when he gets home, when John gets home, he will be at the dinner table with me. And, and then, then we'll, we'll be able to... But when, John, but when John actually gets home, she doesn't say he anymore. She says, you. She says, John, you are home. Can you help me? Can you sit and eat with me? And you're like, okay, not terribly profound. Look at Psalm 23 again. Look at the language. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Did did you catch it now? He makes it, oh yeah, I know he'll do it. But as he gets closer to death, he's like, oh, you, you, you're here. You're, you're like right here. You're not, you're, you know what it means to walk through death. And obviously, King David didn't know what we know, which is that Jesus would, in fact, walk through death, and he would raise again. And he will carry those of us who are his followers across the great divide. We are his children, and he longs like a father to bring us around his massive feast table but let's not miss it it's christmas now christmas no let's not miss it this jesus is god this jesus is with this jesus is god who is with us so face the conflict carry the courage and find the comfort in every christmas movie and decoration and gathering that you have let it point you to emmanuel let's pray father We need your bigness and nearness. We thank you that when there are enemies facing us, confusion or anxiety or depression or addiction or whatever it is, and when we look around frantically trying to find a a way out, a solution, something to save us, we can know that you've already given us a sign in Jesus, that he is Emmanuel that he is God with us. Father, for the person in here who may have been missing it, that they may up until this point not totally have understood who Jesus is, would your spirit just quicken theirs, stir their hearts, let them begin to catch more of a sense that this isn't just a story about some legendary baby. We're talking about Emmanuel. You're so good, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand so we can sing?
thought as we move into this Christmas season, we get closer to our celebrations and our traditions. Let's just rejoice in the fact that we serve the only God who, who became one of us, Emmanuel, God with us. That should encourage us and we should rejoice about that. I want to say thanks for being with us today. If you're new or newish and you filled out an orange card, be sure to drop it in a fishbowl on your way out. We'll look forward to connecting with you. Uh, if you came in on the, in the south side, there's in the south side foyer over here, we have kind of a DIY photo booth, a fo Christmas photo booth over there. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to utilize that with you, your family, your kids, whoever, friends, uh, we'd encourage you to do it. It's really fun. It's really cool over there. You can put it on a Christmas card uh, if you haven't done that like me already. So uh, make sure to take advantage of that. Men, don't forget, uh, if, you for if you leave here today and don't sign up for Man Up, you're going to forget. Don't forget. Sign up for Man Up Retreat. Uh, no excuses. Let's get that done. And then lastly, if you have children over in Grace Kids Ministry here or back here, if you'd head right on over there when we dismiss, we'd greatly appreciate that as we get ready for our next service. We love you. We need you. We look forward to celebrating Christmas together with you. Have a great Sunday.